seven it starts. The bit where the ESV's got the heading bitter water made sweet. I found it that way. Um, then Moses made Israel set out from the Red Sea, and they went into the wilderness of Shur. They went three days in the wilderness and found no water. When they came to Mara, they could not drink the water of Mara because it was bitter. Therefore, it was named Mara. And the people grumbled against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And he cried to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a log, and he threw it into the water, and the water became sweet. There the Lord made for them a statute and a rule, and there he tested them, saying, If you will diligently listen to the voice of the Lord your God, and do that which is right in his eyes, and give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you that I put on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord, your healer. Then they came to Elim, where there were twelve springs of water and seventy palm trees, and they encamped there by the water. They set out from Elim, and all the congregation of the people of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elim and Sinai, on the fifteenth day of the month after they had departed from the land of Egypt. And the whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the people of Israel said to them, Would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full, for you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I am about to rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day, that I may test them whether they walk in my law or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it shall be twice as much as they gather daily. So Moses and Aaron said to all the people of Israel, At evening you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, and in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your grumbling against the Lord. For what are we that you grumble against us? And Moses said, When the Lord gives you in the evening meat to eat, and in the morning bread to the full, because the Lord has heard your grumbling, that you grumble against him, what are we? Your grumbling is not against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, "Say to the people of the, sorry, um, say to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, come near before the Lord, for he has heard your grumbling." As soon as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, they looked towards the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. And the Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of the people of Israel. Say to them, at twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening... Quail came up and covered the camp, and in the morning dew lay around the camp. And when the dew had gone up, there was on the face of the wilderness a fine flake-like thing, fine as frost on the ground. When the people of Israel saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, It is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Gather of it, each one of you, as much as he can eat. You shall take an omer according to the number of persons each of you has in his tent. And the people of Israel did so. They gathered, some more, some less. But when they measured it with an omer, 
Whoever, heard, whoever gathered much had nothing left over, and to add, whoever gathered little had no lack. Each of them gathered as much as he could eat. And Moses said to them, let no one leave any of it over till morning. But they did not listen to Moses. Some left part of it till the morning, and it bred worms and stank, and Moses was angry with them. Morning by morning they gathered it, each as much as he could eat, but when the sun grew hot, it melted. Thank you, Alan, that was great. You brought that to life. So we're setting out with Israel on their journey through the rest of Exodus. That's what we're doing today. And the thing about coming into the story here um, in Exodus 15 is it's kind of like the action's over. We've had all the dramatic stuff. We've had the plagues. Uh, we've had, well, we've had the burning bush. That's even more dramatic, isn't it? Uh, we've had the plagues and all their build-up of hardening of, her of uh, Pharaoh's heart and, and God's judgment. We've had the night of the Passover with all its drama. We've had the crossing of the Red Sea. We've had the great song on the other side of the Red Sea. And then, oh, feels a bit flat. <laughs> you know, we're sort of, we're, we're kind of heading towards Mount Sinai, and Mount Sinai is looming up in the story as this great mountain where God's going to appear, and yet in chapters, the rest of chapter 15, and 16, and 17, and 18, why, why have they got stuck in the middle here? What's going on? What is um, Moses, who wrote this, trying to, trying to tell us about these events? Well, we are getting towards this monumental moment in our Bibles, uh, Mount Sinai and the giving of the Ten Commandments. But the wandering in the wilderness, the grumbling against God, the complaining, the being tested by God, uh, fighting the Amalekites, it might all seem a bit strange and muddled, but it is a bridge between the great act of redemption and where they are traveling to to get to the promised land. There are lessons to be learnt along the way. Yes. Uh, the people of Israel have been redeemed from Egypt. They ought to be filled with purpose. They ought to be so sure of what they're doing and, and thrilled by everything that's happened to them. But they grumble and they complain. And God has to test them. God has to train them, to shape them, to be his people. So there are key lessons that they had to learn between the Red Sea and Mount Sinai. And we're going to learn them with them. And it's interesting, isn't it? Jesus, when he is baptized and he's ready to begin his ministry, he goes into the wilderness. And for 40 days and 40 nights, he is in the wilderness being tempted. And in many ways, he's, if you like, having a little mini exodus, a, a repeat of what the Israelites went through. He's being tempted, he's being trained, he's being tested. And of course, he is the only one who fulfills that test and meets that test. I remember a man coming up to me on the night I was baptized. I was baptized at the age of about 15, I think. I was converted when I was 14. Um, and he came up to me and he said, Jim, the next few months are going to be really hard for you. It's a cheerful thing to say to a 14, 15-year-old on his baptism, isn't it? But he said, the next few months are going to be really hard for you. The evil one is going to want to try and destroy you. So just be aware of that. <laughs> How to encourage me, yeah. But in many ways, that's what's happening here, isn't it? These people are being tested by lots of trying conditions so that they come to trust God. There's a long journey between being justified and being glorified, isn't there? And therefore, we need these lessons in these chapters, as well as the big, powerful revelations at Mount Sinai that await us in chapters 19 and 20 and onwards. So let's come to the two stories that Alan's just read to us. First of all, chapter 15, verse 22. The people of Israel have crossed the Red Sea, they've sung the Song of Moses, and now they've headed into the wilderness. We're not exactly sure um, where they were. There's lots of debates about where the crossing of the Red Sea happened. But they come to an oasis, wherever it was, and it's called Mara. Mara means bitter in Hebrew. Do you remember when um, Naomi came back to Bethlehem in Ruth chapter 1? She says, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara, for the Lord has dealt very bitterly with me. 
That's the word that describes this, this oasis. It's filled with water, but the water is brackish, salty, and they can't drink it. It's bitter. And here are 600,000 people on the march, uh, and, and they need water. They need a lot of it. And when they reach this oasis, they've seen the palm trees around the pool and all the rest of it, and they're excited, and when they get there, it's undrinkable. What do they do? Verse 24, the people grumbled against Moses, saying, what shall we drink? And you'll find that this is a repeated feature of the whole of the wilderness journey. They don't pray to God, they grumble at Moses. So they only look at it at a, a human level. They look at everything from a human perspective and they never think of God. Moses has led them out of Egypt into this great disaster. What are we to do now? Here we all are in the desert. And they're not looking to God. It's all Moses' fault. Well, Moses does the right thing. What does Moses do? Verse 25, he cried to the Lord. And the Lord showed him a log or a tree. And he threw it into the water and the water became sweet. Moses prays to God. And he gets an immediate answer. Now, this must have been some big tree uh, to have completely cured the whole of the water by some natural process. No, I, I think this must have been something miraculous. The tree, if you like, was a sign from God, um, much like Moses' rod dividing the Red Sea. And the whole of this oasis is, is suddenly desalinated. The, the salt is gone and the water is fresh and they can drink. And that's a very powerful picture, isn't it? That God can take bitter things and make them sweet. And Christians have often loved this story. But Christians have often loved this story for all that it, it, it tells us um, about God's ability to change the bitter things in life to sweetness. He can heal and he can refresh. Verse 25 tells us, then the Lord made for them a statute and a rule, and there he tested them, saying, If you will diligently listen to the voice of the Lord your God, and do that which is right in his eyes, and give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you that I put on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord your healer. Now, it's a strange phrase that... Um, if you'll diligently listen, um, I, <clears throat> sorry, the Lord made for them a statute and a rule. The Lord made for them a statute and a rule. Why are we talking about statutes here? Because surely the Lord is going to give the law at Mount Sinai. Yeah, that's where they're going to get the Ten Commandments. That's where they're going to get all the, the law to live by as the people of Israel. But what the Lord is doing is he's instructing them. He's testing them. He's training them. When you hear that word test, what do you think of? I probably think of my driving tests, plural. <laughs> so I failed the first one. Yeah, I can still remember the memory of failing my first driving test uh, with a very particularly numb, unemotional examiner. Um, you know, when we, when we do our driving test, we do it and we've either passed or we've failed. Yeah? There's no learning involved. You've either got to demonstrate you can do it or you clearly can't. Don't think of this test as like that, you know, just testing you to see if you're up to it. Think of the trainer. Think of your driving instructor who is coaxing you all the time. I can still hear my driving instructor as we're going down the hill saying, cover the brake, Jim, cover the brake, you know, and pull it in a little bit and all this sort of thing. Um, he's coaxing you to learn to drive for yourself. Um, I've been following the, the Herdwick Shepherd on Twitter. I think I told you about him when we did the 23rd Psalm. Um, he's a farmer up on the Cumbrian Fells near Oldswater. And every day he puts up photos and videos of his flock and the beautiful scenery where he, where he works. And he's got a, a son and a daughter. I'm not sure how old they are. I think they're about five and seven, something like that. He has given them both their own sheep. Good idea. Um, and so they look after their own sheep. 
and he put up a video the other day of his seven-year-old son sort of walking down the hill like this to get the sheep and its lamb into the right place, you know, and so he's sort of uh, shooing them into the, into the right place. So the shepherd has taught his very young son how to manage his sheep. Very powerful picture, isn't it? He has trained him. Now, I'm sure that meant a lot of very hands-on management to start with, but gradually, as they've made mistakes, as they've got things wrong, Dad has coaxed him into being a competent making of a a young shepherd. Um, And that's what God was doing with Israel. On this journey through the wilderness, he is shaping them. He is training them. He is testing them letting them make mistakes and then showing them a better way so that they learn. They needed to learn that if they were going to survive this long wilderness journey, the most important thing was that they listened to God's voice diligently. To listen to his commandments given through Moses and to do what was right in God's sight. God had redeemed them by his grace and their response, our response, is to be one of obedience. And you'll see in here, just at the end of verse 26, there's a bit of an eerie contrast. Just at the end of verse six, uh, 26, he says, If you will diligently listen to the voice of the Lord your God, etc., I will put none of the diseases on you that I put on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord your healer. God has redeemed them by his grace uh, and their response and ours needs to be one of obedience. They had seen the plagues that fell on the Egyptians for their hard-heartedness. They knew how God could deal with them based on what he'd done to the Egyptians. But, he says, I want to be the very opposite to you as my people. I'm not wanting to be the God of the plagues for you but the God who heals you, the God who supplies all your need, the God who is over you and caring for you and leading you, the God who turns the bitter to sweetness. Indeed, after they'd had that experience at Marah, he led them on to Elim, a a place much loved by many Pentecostal Christians across the world. Uh, This is their favorite passage. Um, They came to Elim, and what did they find? There were 12 springs of water, 70 palm trees. It was a great big oasis. They could fill up their water bottles and their wineskins with water or whatever and and really store up for the next part of the journey. God had supplied them an abundance. So that's the first lesson. Don't grumble against God. Pray to him. And trust him to provide for you. And you will find him to be the God who is the Lord, who is your healer, your provider, the one who cares for you. Now when we turn into chapter 16, they're on the move again. And there's this phrase, all the congregation of the people of Israel. The whole gathering of all those people on the move. It's a huge number of people, isn't it? And um, there they go, they're on their way. They have come, they will become a nation at Mount Sinai, the nation of Israel, but at the moment they're just the people of Israel and these experiences are shaping them to be what they will be. It's an interesting thought, just a little sideline. Most of them are the children descended from Israel, from Jacob, but not all. Some of them are Egyptians who have come with them, who saw the God of Israel at work in Egypt, and they wanted to believe in him and seek him. So they too have joined this multitude, uh, and they are part of the people who are going to be the people of God. God has chosen to, to weave some Egyptians into the nation of Israel. And they come into the wilderness of sin. Now, it's called the wilderness of sin, not because they sin there, but because it's the wilderness of Sinai. It gets its name from Sinai, okay? And 15 days into the journey, what happens? Their food supplies run out. Presumably on their animals and in their wagons, they've, they've got bags of grain, and the bags of grain are running out. And once again, they don't turn to prayer. They grumble against Moses 
and Aaron. Verse 2, the whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And look at what they say. Actually, it's worse than grumbling. This is like a blasphemy. Look at verse 3 of chapter 16. The people of Israel said, Would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Isn't self-pity a destructive thing? I know that from my own experience. That when I wallow in self-pity. All it does is get you deeper and deeper into the mud, doesn't it? It distorts everything that we look at. Had they forgotten how oppressed they'd been by their Egyptian slave drivers? <laughs> Had they forgotten all the terrible things that happened to them in Egypt and they cried out to God and he delivered them? And now they are grumbling again. And you and I can be just the same, can't we? We look at our lives, we wish we were different, we wish that things were so different to the way that they are. And we grumble at other people and we do not cry out to God. And the people of Israel had no sense of what God was about to do. Now, we're not going to look at the whole of this chapter, that's why Alan only read half of it. Um, but verses 4 to 12 are really quite fascinating because there are two levels to the story. hope you can grasp this. On the lower level is, is the practical level. God is providing them with food. Uh, and it's much needed because their food supply is all gone. But there's also an upper level, a spiritual level. God is teaching them something much greater on the spiritual level about himself. So verse 4, God tells Moses about the lower level. Uh, Behold, I'm about to rain bread from heaven for you, and the people should go out and gather a day's portion every day that I may test them, whether they will walk in my law or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather daily. So, says God, there's going to be this very practical, very tangible, very visible sign. Every day you go out and on the ground there will be this bread from heaven. It doesn't really explain at this stage what it will be like, but there will be a, a daily miracle, a flaky fine substance on the ground. How, I've always wondered how the flaky fine substance was not mixed up with the sand <laughs> and the dust, but presumably there was some way that it was. And you could go and you could gather it uh, and uh, each day you could pound that and bake it and do whatever you did with it, and there would be enough to feed them all. And on the sixth day, there would also be double, so that on the seventh day, they could rest, and they didn't have to do any work. Now, that seventh day in the manna miracle is, is very important, and we're going to park that and come back to it when we do the fourth commandment in the Ten Commandments. It's a very important principle that God is teaching them through their daily receiving of manna. So that's what God says to Moses. Down on the first level, the practical level, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to provide you food every day. Then Moses and Aaron go and talk to the people. But what's interesting is they go up to the higher level, to the spiritual level. And they don't actually talk about the practical details very much. So look at verse 6 and 7. They say, at evening, you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning, you shall see the glory of the Lord, because he's heard your grumbling against the Lord. For what are we that you grumble against us? No, you're going to see the Lord reveal his glory, and he's going to do it every day. The people of Israel have been grumbling against Moses, but they should be seeking God. And when they see God perform this miracle, every day they will see his glory. Every day they will know that it was the Lord who brought them out of the land of Egypt. And they will know that he's heard their complaint, he's heard their grumbling, because he has come and revealed his glory to them. And then Moses drops down to the, the, lo the lower level in verse 8 when he says, When the Lord gives you in the evening meat to eat and in the morning bread to the full, 
because the Lord has heard your grumbling that you grumbling against, grumble against him. What are we? Your grumbling is not against us, but against the Lord. Moses and Aaron are just the messengers of the Lord. They should take their complaint to God. Now, in saying all of that, Moses has barely told them what's going to happen. The people of Israel are still scratching their heads. But there's an important connection there, and it's one that you and I need to make, all right? Every part of our lives, our work, our family, our home, our health, our needs, uh, our physical needs, our mental health, whatever it might be, are connected to the spiritual. Paul says to the Corinthians, glorify God with your body, doesn't he? Um, since you belong to God and the Holy Spirit dwells in you, glorify God with your body. There's a tight connection between the spiritual and the physical. And it's all one whole in the way that God deals with us in our relationship with him. So we've got to fit those two together. And that's the key lesson that they're learning here. It's not just God providing them with bread. They need to know the God who is providing them with bread. So they have this sacred encounter. I want you to feel the force of this in verses 9 to 12. God appears to them. So there's no doubt that it is God who is doing this. So Moses and Aaron summon the whole congregation of Israel. Uh, and verse 9 they say, Come near before the Lord, for he has heard your grumbling. And then they look, uh, and, and as soon as the whole congregation of Israel look out to where the, the cloudy pillar of God's presence was standing, there they see the glory of the Lord appearing in the cloud. Now, I imagine that this huge sort of um, twisting cloud standing there, and then a bright light shining out from the middle of it, the sense of God's glory in the pillar, uh, more present and more powerful than ever. And then the Lord says to Moses, and that maybe they hear him say this, I have heard the grumbling of the people of Israel say to them, at twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. This is what the whole experience of the manna was all about. The people had to come to know God as their God. They must see beyond all their own circumstances to realize there's a plan. God is revealing his glory in the way he's dealing with us. This is not just about food, it's about God. It's about God's relationship as the giver of our food. It's not just about survival, it's about our spiritual lives. That we've got to know God and we've got to walk with him. They needed to know that the invisible God, who was making himself known through these visible signs, was there and was revealing himself to them. Now you can see that in all the uh, description that follows. Um, in the evening, quail came up and covered the camp. Like a, a small partridge, um, it, it comes up and it flies a long way over the desert. And then when it's exhausted, it sort of plummets to the ground. And it's so tired that it can hardly move. And you could go and throw a net over it and catch it and, and kill it and eat it. And so the camp is covered with quail. And they've got their meat. They've got their protein. The Lord has provided them with what they need. And in the morning, there's the flaky dust that he provided, and they've got their manna. And it's a very, I, there's a bit of a comedy moment here. I don't know if you realize this. Um, they look at the manna and they say, what is it? <laughs> what should we call it? Well, you said, what is it? <laughs> you said manna, and in Hebrew, manna means what is it? So we'll call it, what is it? The manna, if you want to look at it that way, was the original Watsits, if you want to think of it like that. <laughs> when you open your next packet of Watsits, <laughs> the people of Israel looked at the manna and said, what is it? And, you know, there, there is something rather comical about the name. But here's the significance. Look at verse 15. They said to one another, what is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, it is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. 
Now that's so powerful, isn't it? It is this most rich and powerful sign that God loves you. God cares for you. And God will keep you all the way through this wilderness journey. Every day he's going to remind you that he is the one who's going to provide you with food and get you to the promised land. And each day they gathered just enough and they baked it and they ate it that day. If they tried to save some, it bred worms and it stank and it was horrible and it was just gross and they had to chuck it out. Every day they had some to eat. They had enough to eat. And they had double for the next day when it was um, the Sabbath. Except for one potful. Now, if you look down at verse 32, um, let an omer of manna be kept throughout your generations so that they can see the bread with which I fed you in the wilderness. So they took a jar, they filled it with the bread they'd baked from the manna, they put a lid on it, and that was placed in the, the, the holy place. I think they may even have put it in the Ark of the Covenant when that had been built. So they carried one potful as a reminder that God fed them every day all the way to the land of plenty, the promised land. And when they crossed over and they entered the promised land, the manna ceased. Now, what a powerful picture that is. God was teaching them the principle that Jesus taught us in the Lord's Prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. In other words, we don't ever just think, I've got everything I need. But rather, they think, I am relying on what God gives me every day, and I live in relationship to him. Now, I want to go to three Bible passages that use this miracle. My time is nearly gone, so we'll try and go through these fairly quickly. Three Bible passages that will shed a bit of light uh, on this uh, particular incident. First of all, Deuteronomy 8, verses 2 and 3. What is God dealing, doing with Israel on their wilderness journey? He's humbling them. He's training them. He's testing them. He wants to know what is in their hearts. He humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus needs to do the same with us. To have come and trusted in Jesus as our Savior is wonderful. It's great that we found salvation in Jesus. We've become Christians. But we're still sinful people with deceitful hearts. We are justified, but we're not yet glorified. We're in that in-between phase of the Christian life, which is a battle and a struggle, and where we need to be spiritually disciplined. For the Israelites, the discipline was every morning to go out and gather your manna. Gather everything that you needed to feed your family. That job must have made them meditate on God's goodness to them. Yeah, if you had to do it every day. But God had this greater lesson to teach them. He said, I did all that to humble you, to let you hunger, and I fed you with manna, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. God was going to reveal himself in words to Israel. You know, the book of Exodus is part of that great revelation. The, the words spoken at Mount Sinai were key to understanding their relationship with God. Words would be very, very important to them. The, the law that was written down would be crucial. And the people needed to listen to the law. They needed to listen to all that God had revealed to them, to know him, and to learn to live out the word of the Lord. He gave them the book of Deuteronomy, which this verse is from, because it's a second giving of the law, a great long book of the Old Testament, one of the mountain books of the Old Testament. It's a sort of one of the key pillars of Old Testament revelation. It's a handbook for living in the land and, and taking the redemption that God has performed for them and putting it to work. Now, we have the whole of completed scripture the whole of our Bibles, to guide us. And we need to be reading it every day and feeding while we're reading. 
it's some, something we haven't yet done as a church plant is to think about a reading scheme that we do together. I don't know what you would think of that. Um, it's great to be you know, setting ourselves the challenge of saying, well, we'll all read the same book of Scripture together and we'll discuss it and we'll feed on it together. Do you read the Bible every day? And do you allow it to soak into your heart? Our spiritual lives need every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord so that we can put it to work in our living. And Moses adds just after that, I haven't put it on the screen, verse 5, Know then in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, the Lord your God disciplines you. Through the whole wilderness journey, God was disciplining, shaping, forming the spiritual life of the people of Israel. And he does the same for us. In all the twists and turns of our lives, he is humbling us. He is disciplining us. He's bringing us back to his word. He's feeding us again. He's refreshing us. It's, it's a wonderful thing to say, isn't it? I am the Lord who heals you. He heals all our spiritual diseases. He sorts us out. He brings us back to spiritual health. He revives us. He renews us. He refreshes us. And that way he teaches us to come and love him and know him through his word. Second passage from um, John 6, verse 31. Jesus has just fed the 5,000. He's crossed the lake and, and the crowd have come and found him asking what they must do to be doing the works of God and what sign would Jesus give them so that they could believe in him. And they say, our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. And Jesus says in reply, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. So the manna was a sign uh, that they needed to trust God every day. They needed to feed on what God provided for them every day and feed on his word. And if you like, the manner is assigned to us. We need to receive Jesus every day. We need to go to God's word, whether it's Old Testament or new, to find more of Jesus every day. Jesus is the one who satisfies our spiritual hunger. He atones for our guilt. We need that atonement every day, don't we? He gives strength to us to control our evil desires. Without him, we will fail. He gives wisdom to us in making our decisions. When there's so much else in the world that disgusts us, including our own hearts, we go to Jesus and we find that he is the, the altogether lovely. Yeah? He's the one we truly delight in. He satisfies our spiritual thirst day by day. And that's why we read our Bibles, not as a duty, but as a delight. Because there we meet Jesus and we feed on him. We need to feed on him every day. Finally, 1 Corinthians 10, uh, Paul says, <clears throat> I want you to know, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea and all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them. And the rock was Christ. Now, I might come back to this a little bit more next week when we think about water from the rock. Every step of the Israelites' journey from Egypt to the Promised Land had a spiritual fulfillment in Jesus. Their food and drink, their travel, uh, all the different incidents that happened along the way foreshadowed what we have in Christ. And Jesus needs to be our spiritual food and our spiritual drink, the one who truly satisfies our souls. So I want to say, what do you come to church for? Do you come to church just to meet your friends, just out of a sense of obligation and duty? I remember working in a shoe shop when I was a teenager, and that one of the staff was a Roman Catholic, and she said to me rather grudgingly, well, 
Saturday night, tonight, we're going to go down to the Catholic Church and do our obligation. I thought, what a, what a grim way to describe going to church, to do your obligation. I hope we come to church with a great desire, a desire for Jesus, to feed on him in our hearts by faith, to say, he is my saviour and I need him so much. And without him, I do not have hope. He is my redeemer. He is my rock. He's my spiritual food. He's the bread of life for my soul and the water of life that refreshes me every day. So the people of Israel began their journey, and we're going to follow that journey in the wilderness with this great sign of daily bread being given them from heaven, just as God's word gives us Jesus every day. God was with them on their journey, and he promises to be with us and feed us if we will obey him and stick close to him and come to trust and rely upon him as our strength and our daily food. May God bless his word to us this morning. Sorry that it's taken so long. Um, there's a lot to get through today.